Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. All right, welcome to this Savage Nation Friday edition. It's unprotected talk, 855-407-282 gets you on the radio with more people than you'll meet for the rest of your life. It's Open Mic to Mike Friday. I want to talk about the difference between fame and heroes today on the Savage Nation, at least for a moment. And then I want to talk about the movement of troops from Iran into Syria to prevent the downfall of Assad, just as I predicted yesterday. I knew that uh, that was what was behind it. I figured ISIS was being supported by the U.S. and Israel. This would definitely confirm my suspicion that the reason the U.S. has not attacked the ISIS columns, the reason the U.S. has not stopped ISIS is because they're actually our ally, as uh, as are they the ally of Israel. And in hours, we're expecting this from, we're getting this rather from Debka file out of Israel. They say in the coming hours, Iran is going to invoke the 06 Iranian Syrian Defense Pact to urgently airlift substantial numbers of Iranian troops to Syria to save Assad's regime and his army from collapse. And this is because Syrian army divisions are breaking up under the ISIS assault on the northern Kurdish town of Hasaka and the onslaught of the Syrian opposition army of conquest in the southern town of Dara. Now, we have, as you well know, supplied and trained the Syrian opposition army. That's John McCain's troops. And Syrian troops are now fleeing the front lines of both, pardon me, embattled cities. It's, as I suspected, a terrible situation that we are, we have the blood on our hands of ISIS. We Americans have enabled ISIS to get where they are to commit these atrocities against the human race. This is what happens when you have no morality in a nation. This is what happens when you have no leadership, just Machiavellian calculations. And so it leads us, in a way, back to the issue of fame and heroism. We're focused now on a degenerate who thinks that dressing up as a woman and making everyone look at him as a woman is the equivalent of being a hero. And because of the vermin in the media who have glorified this this, this psychopath, this mentally ill individual, the children in our country are in grave danger of never knowing the difference between sanity, insanity, and what a real hero is. They're actually thinking that a fat person who waves her behind around on television for five years is a hero. They don't know what a hero is. In my day, a guy like Bruce Jenner would have been severely treated by psychiatrists or put in a mental hospital and guarded around the clock from hurting themselves or others. But now we have doctors who are so sick that they mutilate men. They mutilate women to convert them into a sex that they were not born to. This is not about homosexuality. This is about the mutilation of a human being. Now, I ask you, do you think that, do you think that radical Islam is rising around the world in a vacuum? They're not rising around the world in a vacuum. This nation was once a torch of liberty to the world. This nation was once a torch of heroes to the world. This nation was once looked up to around the world. But since we put this demented anti-American into the White House, the nation has imploded. It has collapsed morally, militarily, any way you want to look at it. So therefore, when the nation collapses morally or socially, what rises up in its place? Well, Bruce Jenner the putrid garbage being spewed by Hollywood, has now produced a freak show where the freaks are now running America. That's right, freaks. Now, I challenge anyone listening to this show to tell me if the word degenerate or pervert still applies in this country. Tell me what a degenerate is, someone who loves America. Tell me what a pervert is, someone who loves America. They have turned the world upside down and they're a very small minority. Make no mistake about it. The freaks and the perverts and the anti-Americans are a very small minority, and yet they are ruling over this nation. That is how a man as demented as Bruce Jenner can be held up as a symbol of something wonderful and wholesome. No, he's not wonderful and wholesome. He's a very sad, sick individual who is so desperate for attention that he would mutilate his body through surgery in order to attract your attention for a dying second. So it brings us back to who is your hero. What is a real hero? What is a hero? 
Well, I looked up what a hero is, and there's a m- dozens of good definitions, but we often confuse the two in defining a hero or a, a, a famous person. We, we confuse the two. And uh, people have said fame is this and heroism, hero, heroism is that. I don't know what your definition is. I'll read you a few of them. Albert Einstein said, If my theory of relativity is proven successful, Germany will claim me as a German, and France will declare me a citizen of the world. Should my theory prove untrue, France will say that I am a German, and Germany will declare that I am a Jew. Albert Einstein. Sun Tzu, the ancient Chinese philosopher, wrote, The general who advances without coveting fame and retreats without fearing disgrace, whose only thought is to protect his country and do good service for his sovereign, is the jewel of the kingdom. We have no such generals. We have no such generals in the United States of America. We did at one time have them. We don't have them anymore. Notable quotes on fame. Let's see what else we have for you. Charles Churchill said, fame is nothing but an empty name. Leonardo da Vinci is alleged to have written, fame should be depicted covered with tongues, instead of with feathers and in the form of a bird. I don't know what that means. A sign of celebrity is often that their name is worth more than their services. That's pretty good. Benjamin Franklin said, If you would not be forgotten as soon as you are dead, either write things worth reading or do things worth writing. That's pretty good. If you would not be forgotten as soon as you are dead, either write things worth reading or do things worth writing. St. Augustine said, The desire for fame tempts even noble minds. Let's see what John Genet said. The fame of heroes owes little to the extent of their conquests and all to the success of the tributes paid to them. Stuff like that. Confucius said, care not for being unknown, but seek to be worthy of note. Worthy of note. Worthy of note. Look what Hollywood has done to the concept of heroism and fame. It started in the 1960s with the worship of the, quote, anti-hero. In other words, the anti-family, anti-church, anti-American individuals that were promoted by Hollywood, the the known anti-heroes at the time, have now been elevated to the point where you actually confuse them with actual heroes. But there are real heroes. Who are they? Who are your heroes? Do you have any left? Are there any left? Let's focus for a moment on an individual who was never qualified to be anything other than a hate monger, Hillary Clinton. And she hit a new low yesterday when she went before a black audience that was, they had to cover the auditorium up with screens because nobody was there. She's running a Capricorn One campaign. She's hated. Nobody likes her. She just has hundreds of millions of dollars to spend fooling you into thinking that because she lacks a penis, she's worthy of the presidency. What a qualification that would be. What a qualification that is. I mean, because she's not a man, she's worthy of the presidency. So Hillary went to a new low yesterday. She's gotten so ugly so fast that she started accusing everyone who opposes her of being a racist. Listen to clip two of this individual. We have a responsibility to say clearly and directly what's really going on in our country. Because what is happening is a sweeping effort to disempower and disenfranchise people of color, poor people, and young people from one end of our country to the other. Goebbels in a skirt. A hate monger, an ugly hate monger, a monster who is not qualified to lead a, a sewer brigade, let alone a nation such as ours. If you think it's bad under Obama, you're right. But if you ever put this creature into the White House, you won't know what bad is. This woman is so hateful and so desperate that she goes before a black crowd at a black college, very few people show up, and her handlers cover up the auditorium with curtains. So they show show you a crowd, a little crowd that they tightly focus on with the cameras along the lines of Lenny Reifenstahl who worked for Hitler. And then instead of giving an uplifting speech, which draws us together, she goes back to the ugliness that gave her the power to begin with which is hate, nothing but hate, with big lies, one lie after another. So it comes back to who is your hero, really. Who is your hero? Hillary Clinton is your hero? How could any woman listening to this show want to elect her? I have nothing against a woman president. I mean, 
uh, what should I say? I like women. That's not the point. Qualified woman, let her be president. Maybe Fiorina has gotten over her love for illegal immigration, and I could support her. I know she ran for governor here in California, and she destroyed herself by supporting amnesty for illegals, and I haven't heard her on that yet. But she would certainly not be a hate monger like Hillary. She's actually run a corporation, unlike Hillary, who's run nothing but the uh, Clinton Scam Foundation. So who is your hero? Let's see if we get any calls on the open mic to mic show. The phone number again is 855 407 I'm going to give you the latest breaking news. We're going to talk about what is the difference between a hero uh, and a famous person. We're going to play you some great sound, and we'll take some interesting calls right here on The Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. It is Black Friday on the Savage Nation. I have a sense of gloom and doom. I really do. I feel like the world's going to blow. I have an intuition that something's going to happen very soon. It's going to blow it all up. I don't mean the whole world's coming to an end. Don't get me wrong. I have a feeling that when the Iranian troops, the Iranian guard, are dropped into Syria to protect Assad, and they face off against ISIS and the United States, the hidden troops we have there, this could bring Israel into the, into the mix. We could wind up with World War III. This is such a mismanaged situation. We have such a nut in the White House. Such an incompetent nut in the White House. I just have this terrible feeling in my guts about the world right now because it's a little too quiet. And the country is so demented right now that we're looking at a man dressed up as a woman as though he's a hero. He is the opposite of a hero. Doesn't mean a man shouldn't dress up as a woman. He wants to do it. Why is this man held up on a pedestal as a role model? Who is your hero? Let's go to line number two, WMAC in Georgia. Line two, go ahead, please. Mike, you are my hero because you get paid to spout nonsense and fiction for a living. You are my hero. All right, all right fine, great. All right, what else is on your mind, sicko? Well, I want to tell you, who are you to define what a hero is? Well, who are you to even question me? You're nobody. You're just calling from a prison cell somewhere. What, what have you ever done that anyone would pay any a note, attention to you? Who are you? Who are you? You're an, who am I, idiot? I've written 30 books. I have a real PhD. I've traveled the world. I've saved rainforests. I have a great track record. Who are you, unknown hater? I'm not an unknown hater. I'm a man who disagrees with you, so you make me a You hater. disagree with me how? By trying to denigrate everything I've achieved without knowing what I've achieved because you've read garbage on the Internet? You know nothing. You denig You know nothing. You're a zero. Tell me who. Tell me. I'll tell you what. You know everything about me. Tell me what you've achieved. Give me an example of one thing you have written that I should read. Went to medical school. I trained at one of the most great. Did you? You trained at what are you doing with your medical school degree? What do you care? I'm more I no, what do I care? You're holding yourself up as a great role model of a hero. Tell me what you do in medicine. I'm working as a physician. It's that, what what I do So what? Because you're peddling drugs to people that makes you a healer? Are you, are you... Because you peddle drugs to people, you look people's charts on the wall, and you call yourself a healer? You're a drug pusher. I'm a drug... A crack dealer in Baltimore is to be more respected than most doctors today. At least they call themselves drug dealers. You're a drug pusher, that's all you are with a medical degree. What, because you wear a stethoscope that makes you into a healer? And the idea that you... That's all. We got a real hater there, a, a wonderful one. Well, I feel much better. Let him go home now and hate himself a little bit more. He's just jealous of me. It's that simple. He cannot believe that I have a national audience because I'm a better man than he is with a better education and, and better uh, you know, productivity. He thinks being a medical doctor makes him a healer? There's a little difference between medicine and healing, isn't there? Ask anybody who knows anything about anything about the difference between medicine and healing. Now, it's true that burn, cut, and poison is one theory of medicine, and it works in many cases, and God bless them for being able to burn, cut, and poison things. But not everyone needs to be burned, cut, and poisoned in order to be healed. And unfortunately, most people who go into medicine today go into it only for the money, nothing else. They don't go into it to heal. So let's go back to something uglier than ugly itself, which is Hillary Clinton's words. She is so desperate because she's collapsed in the polls because people know what a, crim a criminal she is and how unqualified she is at any speed. 
So she goes before, and this is a fact, by the way, an all-black uh, college audience, no one really shows up. It's a small group of a couple of hundred people in an auditorium that could hold thousands. And her handlers drop curtains around the audience, the empty seats. So idiots like that alleged doctor who just called don't want to know the truth about her hero, their hero. And instead of talking about an uplifting message, something uh, that a president should do to bring us together, unite us, she tries to divide us by making blacks feel that they're disenfranchised by making the poor feel that they're disenfranchised, by making young people feel that someone owes them a living. Listen to the lie coming out of the mouth of this ugly creature called Hillary Clinton in clip three. Today, Republicans are systematically and deliberately trying to stop millions of American citizens from voting. Yes. What part of democracy are they afraid of? We're afraid of your Hitler-like behavior. Citizen has the right to vote, and I believe we should do everything we can to make it easier for every citizen to vote. How many times should they vote, Hillary? As many times as they voted for your husband? Five, six times? Here's a little note. George Soros, probably the most evil man in the history of the world, next to, let's say, the overt dictators who killed millions, one of the most evil people to have ever been created by God, is going to bankroll voting rights cases. He is going to sh sue states that want to make certain that only qualified citizens vote and only vote once. That's right. Now, why does George Soros want illegal aliens to vote? Why does he want unqualified people to vote? Why does he want people to vote as many times as possible? Because that's the only way that criminals can continue to ruin America. And now they're on the same page. Hillary Clinton with the big lie. George Soros bankrolling voting rights cases. You heard it first on the Savage Nation. Who are your heroes, though? I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. It is an upside-down world. Deviants, perverts, degenerates are held up as role models and called heroes while the heroes of America are either not heard from or systematically denigrated by the vermin in the media. Welcome back to the Savage Nation. I do hope that the, quote, doctor who called me in the last segment who tried to attack me does not hurt himself or one of his patients, by either by over-prescribing a medicine that people don't need or whatever. I just hope he goes home and takes a few deep breaths before he hurts himself or someone else. I got a wonderful letter about my new book, Countdown to Mecca, which I feel obligated to read to you. Yes, it was written to me by my number one sponsor, Craig Smith of Swiss America. Swiss, Amer sorry, Swiss America has been supporting my, my show from the beginning. They've been with me from the beginning. They're my largest advertiser. And he read my novel. And you've got to hear what he said. I wouldn't read it to you if it wasn't unique. Michael, I just finished your novel, Countdown to Mecca, last night. Wow, what a finish. You literally had me by the neck, holding me into the plot, and then the twists and turns that took place. I wanted to use a part of my body to describe how I was held in thought by the ending, but chose to be polite. I know you hear it over and over, and I also know you know, but Michael, you're seriously in a class of genius that the world seldom, if ever, experienced. You are a true gift from God to man. It is the only explanation for a mind that can do what you do. I have read four novels in my entire life yours being the fourth. I have never liked reading anything that wasn't about facts that I could learn from. What a fool I was, for you opened a new way of thinking for me. I have your other Jack Hatfield novels and can't wait to start them. I am so grateful I know a man like you, Michael. You really are something unique and beyond words to describe. Well, I read it because it's self-serving, number one, and number two, because it is a political thriller. And it's a way for me to get ideas out there about the dangers of Islamofascism and the weakness of our government military establishment that I generally cannot do in any other way. So if you want an enjoyable read and want to give something for Father's Day, there it is. But who is your hero? WABC Line 1, what's your topic? Please go ahead. Michael, my son passed away from cancer a year ago. Treated well in New York. You, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Your son passed happened? He was treated very well. York Hospital for cancer. 28-year-old boy. 
But, Michael, you were his hero. Every day he watched you, heard you on the radio, we listened to you. You are his hero. You brought a smile to his face. Yes, the doctors were good, but there was no greater pleasure to see some liberal nurse or doctor come in the room, and we would have your show on, blasting away in between between horrific treatments that this kid went through. Oh, and God. a father to a father, you are a great American, and you are a, a hero to countless, countless people in this country. And I just wanted to thank you for bringing a few moments of joy to my son to a very painful situation. Do you care to tell the, the audience your son's name and his memory? Sure. My son's name is Jerry Massaner. He was a Mammoth University 20-year-old student who got diagnosed with neuroblastoma. Uh, that's a pediatric cancer. He was yep. 20 years old, and he should have gotten it when he was 20 months. And he survived for eight years when everyone said he would couldn't do it. And we have a foundation for him. He's a one. We, we have just a tremendous support group for him and his family. But Michael, it was just a, just a wonderful smile on his face. When he would go to an MRI and they would ask him, what do you want to hear? And he'd say, can you put on the Michael Savage show? Now, you know, in New York doctors, that's like taboo. But Michael... Yeah, I know. Most of them are very, very liberal. They uh, have been brainwashed. I understand that. Correct. And it's funny that it's ironic that I follow a doctor who just made that call to you. Yes, there's many good doctors. And we came across a couple of not so good doctors, but you are his best medicine. I, I, what is? What, please spell his last name again. I couldn't catch it. Sure. It's Jerry, J-E-R-R-Y, and his last name is Messana, M-E-S-S-A-N-A. -S -S mm-hmm. Well, Mr. Messana, I can only give you, I hate to say for Father's Day because it's heartbreaking to say it when you just lost a son. But I'm going to give you a Father's Day gift of my novel. It's all I've got to give you, sir. I, I have nothing else to offer you right now. Uh, you can call me Jerry because I'm Jerry Sr. And I'm your fan for over uh, 25 years. Michael, would you do me one favor? Sure. Autograph the book because I like to raffle it off at one of the benefits that I'm having this, uh, this July. Let's see if we can arrange that, sir. But I'm very, very sorry that you've gone through this. But you still sound like... You have the energy to go on and don't let go. Don't let go and don't let the, the, the haters get you down. Listen, Please stay on the line and we'll get you a copy of that book as soon as possible. Is there anything, uh, is there any greater loss than a person can experience than losing a child? I don't know. I've read about it. I hear that that's the worst that there is, is that we all have to lose our parents. That's just the order of things. But a parent isn't supposed to watch the child go into the ground. And that, when it happens, leaves a devastation in the heart and soul of the, of the family that you could never imagine. Uh, it, uh, it happened in my family. I know the devastation it wrought upon my parents and upon the surviving children and the scars it leaves because the survivor's guilt uh, of the others is overwhelming. They say, it should have been me. Why wasn't it me? What, why was he picked? Why did God do to him? You can't let that go on. You can't let that enter your head. You just got to accept that this is the way things happen and you can't ask why it was him and not you or things like that. There's no healing a thing like that if you get into the, the self-hating. All right, look, it's Friday. We're supposed to have a little bit of a good time today. I don't know what's wrong with me today. I told you that I have a very, very intuitive personality. As rational as and scientific as I can be, and I can be like a laser in my analysis and my using deductive reasoning and all of that kind of stuff. I uh, studied Aristotelian logic and mathematics. I can reason as well as anybody. But I feel something is going on right now in the world. I almost feel crazy to tell you this. I just have an intuitive feeling that something horrible is about to happen in the world. I hope that I'm crazy and wrong. And I hope I'm not bumming you out. Nature abhors a vacuum. And right now America is a gigantic black hole. It's a vacuum. There is no leadership on any level. We have elevated the lowest to the highest, and the highest have been relegated to the lowest. And into that breach, something will step. 
That's what I fear. Now let's take another call. KSFO. Hope I'm not bumming you out. You know, what can I do? You know, I can't be anything but what I am. This is a three hour show, five days a week. So some days you're going to get me in one mood, some days in another mood. I'm not a consistent personality. Uh, today, I don't know why I feel this way. I really don't have any answer for it. I didn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed. I can't say it was the sausage and spaghetti last night. I went to an all-you-can-eat sausage and spaghetti. I went to the cheapest Italian restaurant, a chain restaurant I could find, because you don't have to talk to anybody. It's like a luncheonette. And by the time I finished the first order, I didn't want the second, even though it was all-you-can-eat. Now, a lot of fat people had left just as I walked in. They must have eaten five orders of... Uh, they were all you can eat pasta. And they took home one that they made believe they wanted to eat there and then they put it in the bag to go. I don't know how the business stay I don't know how they stay in business. It's like the people I know who run Indian buffets and you see the, the gardeners come in, all you can eat and you see the gardeners eat five plates of food, stuffing it into their overalls in little plastic baggies. I say to the Indian guy, Can't you say only two trips to the bin allowed? He's oh no, 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 we can't do that. I say, You're gonna go you're gonna go out of business. They don't listen to me. They don't understand that people will take advantage of your good nature. Just as Hillary Clinton is taking advantage of the good nature of trusting black people and trusting poor people and naive young people, uh, it's the same thing on any level. She is literally stealing the truth from the air itself. All right, time for another call. KSFO Radio, San Francisco, line number three. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, Dr. Shevich. My name is Mark Kesefo. My topic is the heroes. I have two of them, if I may. The first is a policeman, a friend of mine's father growing up, and the funny thing was his mother had a bumper sticker on their car that said, if you don't like cops, next time you're in trouble, call a hippie. That's funny. Yeah, my my take on that was when I'd get a liberal on the show, I'd say, you don't like cops, the next time you're, cl you're crossing a dark street at 3 in the morning, and a group of thugs crosses the street coming at you, and you can only make one call with your cell phone, would it be 911 or ACLU? Well, I guess today you could replace the uh, hippie with gang member, protester, or terrorist. Yeah, they're about the same thing. That's what hippies have morphed into, correct? That's what they gave us. That is the spawn of the hippie. Oh. Obama, is the, Obama is the end line of the, of the hippie movement. What began with the beatnik has ended with Obama. He is the end line of that entire that entire arc. You know, in, in film they say there's an arc. The arc of the downfall of America started with the beatnik movement in the 50s and it ended with Barack Obama, the most unqualified man in history to become president. And look where we are today. So what else is on your mind? Uh, there's a young lady named Lauren Hill. She passed away from brain cancer. She was a basketball player at a small college. ESPN was going to give her the courage Award. They, I know that. Instead, they gave it to the psych, the, the psychopath, uh, Bruce Jenner. The, ne the egomaniac psychopath, Bruce Jenner. I get it. Sickening. Yeah, it, it drives me crazy. And, uh, you know, they're owned by, uh, by Disney, I believe. Well, okay. Do you need to know any more than Michael Eisner? Just say, Mike, say Michael Eisner or Iger and you know what's going on. You don't need to know any more. Dr. Savage, you're, you're truly a gem. Well, I don't know about being a gem. I appreciate your call, and I'm sending you a free copy for Father's Day of Countdown to Mecca. I want to do calls right now. I mean, it's heartbreaking to play the sound, but the hate, the hate that Hillary's putting out, it's just so phenomenal. You know, <clears throat> it was Goebbels, Hitler's propagandist, who said, if you tell a big lie often enough, it will become the truth. So now we find out that George Soros is funding voter rights cases around America just in time to try and push the Hildebeest, over the finish line. And instead of lifting us up and telling us why we should vote for her as a woman, she then goes to the lowest common denominator and tries to stir up, listen to clip two, listen to how sick this is. We have a responsibility to say clearly and directly what's really going on in our country. Because what is happening is a sweeping effort to disempower and disenfranchise people of color, poor people, and young people from one end of our country to the other. I would say shame on you, but you know this woman is incapable of shame. There is no way of shaming the class of people who have popped up from the, from the swamps of the American political landscape. And she is perhaps the worst of all of them. I could live with a Democrat 
in my day, but not today. There are no Democrats today. They're all demagogues. The Democrats have all become demagogues. That's the problem. And if I'm forced to choose a Republican, I will choose a Republican. It certainly will not be anyone in the uh, the John Boehner McConnell school. And I see a good uh, I see a good group group of candidates fighting with each other. That's a good thing. Of course, the vermin in the media are trying to make that into a clown show. The actual democracy that's going on in the Republican side of many different candidates competing for the crown is actually the mark of a good a good thing. Instead of the, the one-party system and the one candidate on the Democrat, Socialist, Islamist left, that's something for you to remember. Just remember that. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. The only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Not George Bush, turn it off. That was his favorite group. Lives in like ditzy land. Drives around in a pickup truck and thinks the world is just a swell place. Eats at Denny's, thinks the food is good, likes white bread and mayonnaise. Anyway, welcome back to the Savage Nation. So I don't know where the doom is coming from, the gloom. I don't understand it. I just did this terrible vacuum out there. So as I told you, you know, we support animal groups. The family does, my family. We don't talk about it much. I did once last week because I was sick and tired of people denigrating me. So Mrs. S. is on a plane right now to an East Coast city to see the dogs that she has saved. She supports a group that does something with standard poodles that they give to prisons. And she said to me, the poodles turn out to be the hardest dogs in the world for prisoners to control. No, they don't listen to anybody. They're very aloof and they don't listen to anybody. So they had to give them back to the women who raised them. And she supports them. So she's on the plane. And we're texting back and forth. I figured she's leaving. She goes, oh, you know, they send I'm in the seat. Everything's fine. And uh, it'll be great. I feel good. Thank God I'm getting away. And she says, only one loudmouth uh, blasting the plane. Well, I guess that's what the Bose headphones are for. So then the next thing, I send a note to her and I say, enjoy the trip. Don't let anyone or any event upset you. She says, only one loudmouth retired military shooting his mouth off. Everyone's forced to listen to him. So I say, you can ask the stewardess to ask him to lower his volume. Now, I just got this a minute ago. You ready for this? The steward did on his own without me having to ask. They are two old guys not wearing their hearing aids. But here's the bad news. Someone on the plane had a heart attack, so they had to return to the gate. We're waiting for new oxygen before we can take off. Oh, God. I mean, you ask why I don't go anywhere. They said to me, why didn't you go see the charity that you support? Why don't you play with the dogs and then go down to a Florida or whatever? I hate traveling. So now she's sitting there on a tarmac with, with oxygen dep deprivation. The heart attack job. I had a friend who told me he had someone died on an airplane. See, I, they said to me, why don't you go? I said, first of all, I don't like traveling. Secondly, I hate airplanes. Thirdly, I said, you know what I think I feel like after the flu I've just gotten over? She'll get up to go to the restroom, and she'll come back. I'll look like Ratso Rizzo in Midnight Cowboy, dead in the, dead in the chair. We started to, he started to laugh hysterically. He said, I had a friend who died in a plane. It's not a funny thing. Well, who said it's funny? But I have a uh, sarcastic sense of humor. I just know it's not the right time for me to be in the air with the pressure on the head and the sinuses and the, the, the asking for a glass of water like it's champagne. The control, the control, the feeling like a, fry, a flying frying pan, a flying prison camp. A real pleasure today. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Islam. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. It has been quite a week. Savage Nation. I would say the higher low point, depending upon your religious viewpoint, was when I asked on Wednesday 
should all the passages calling for murder and killing be taken out of the Old Testament and the Quran in the United States? That set off a, a shockwave. And in typical fashion, no one else mentioned it in the media, even though it's the most, I would say, the most poignant question in the history of talk radio and the most daring question ever raised in talk radio. I wouldn't expect anyone to mention it. It's easy to talk about other subjects. That's a tough one. And then uh, I would say yesterday's show was another, you know, kind of a s seminal show, a, a tour de force. I don't even want to repeat it. It was awesome. The music that I picked and my sense that it's all um, uh, a hustle, everything's a hustle on both sides of the aisle, was a good show. I know it's negative. I know you want to believe in something and you got to believe in something and you got to let those balloons fly and clap and cheer when the politicians speak. But I don't know. I'm pretty cynical. I was cynical at age five by what I saw in the world. So what should I do? Sit here and cheer you on and tell you this one, that one? I don't know. You'll make up your own mind anyway. Just remember, I'm only a talk show host. I am not a politician. It is not my job to promote any candidate. I'm not in business to promote candidates. In fact, I think it's illegal to promote candidates. To be very honest with you, I don't know how people in talk radio who have candidates on on one side of the aisle and not others get away with it because I think it's purely illegal. Incidentally, by the way, if I were to only have Republican candidates on this show and no Democrats, I would be violating the laws of the public airwaves. Now, you'd say, well, it's just balancing out what they do on the other side. That's true. They are violating the laws as well. So I try to have no guests on to do with politics because basically it's electioneering. That's not my job. I'm not. <clears throat> Talk radio is more than politics. How many times have I had to say to you over the 20 years, that if this was just about politics, I would have left after the first day. There's so much more in the world than politics. And yet politics seems to rule the day in talk radio. Somebody called talk radio today, conveyor belt radio. Conveyor belt radio, Rush comes on, then the next one comes on, the next one comes on, the next one comes on. And whatever he does, they copy, like a conveyor belt, the same topics. They, he said, with the exception of you and maybe Alex Jones, there's nobody else doing original radio. I said, okay, whatever you want to think, but I didn't come into this business just to talk about politics. My mind is, is you know, not made that way. So I tried to do that this week. Was I quoted anywhere? No. Did anyone say it's one of the most brilliant radio shows they ever heard? No. Was I invited to a corporate a retreat to talk about my ideas? No. Was I offered a prize from the radio industry for breaking new ground? No. No one heard it, except you, the audience. So... I keep doing it anyway because I may say I make believe I'm in a cafe called Cafe Savage and I own the cafe and you come into the cafe to relax to have a cup of coffee a biscotti whatever glass of wine whatever you want and in the typical fashion of a cafe owner of the old days basically I talk and we have a conversation that's what a cafe is I mean that's what it used to be until they became Starbucks that's not a cafe so there's a coffee house that's different they serve coffee that's not a cafe so let's talk about all the other topics. Now, I have some political topics up on michaelsavage.com, home of the Savage Nation. Let's look at them. Obama secretly backing the Muslim Brotherhood. A strategy document regards the group as moderate. You hear this? And they're moderate, the Muslim Brotherhood, and their front group in America is CAIR. Next one. Huge drop in stop and frisk as New York City crime increases. Raises fear that cops are reluctant to confront criminals. No kidding. What would you do if you were a cop? You'd stop and frisk a thug, and if, God forbid, he didn't have a gun, you'd go to jail and lose your job? So let him go kill somebody, that's all. Not until all of America becomes Baltimore and everyone's begging for a cop again, then maybe we'll have a, a law and order again in this country. No, let the liberals destroy everything. Then maybe the America will wake up to what liberalism does. Here's another fake imam. Listen to this story. Gangster turned imam may have radicalized dozens behind bars. See, this is the new racket. He was a gangster in Brooklyn, held up banks, just a plain out gangster. Former U.S. Marine, became a Muslim radical, gang leader and bodyguard to the blind sheik behind the 93 World Trade Center bombing. Is so adept at turning fellow prisoners into potential extreme jihadists that Florida prison officials have kept him in shackled and in solitary confinement for the last three years. And federal authorities want a judge to tack on another three decades, but his dirty lawyer wants him freed immediately. Marcus Jawain Robertson... A Muslim extremist, also known as Imam, 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 everyone's an Imam. 
He once led a murderous black New York gang dub, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. Then he resurfaced decades later as a radical imam at a Florida mosque. See, that's the new game, is that if, you're, if a criminal, a career criminal, now calls himself an imam, suddenly everyone gets on their hands and knees. Oh, he's a religious figure. Oh, we can't say anything to him. Oh, no, everyone's an imam. Tell me what, it, what the qualifications are to become an imam. Does anyone know? I would say that you could buy an imam's license in a Cracker Jack box for about a nickel. The same way that uh, Al Sharpton became a reverend, I would say you could become an imam today. But you say imam and put a, a skull cap on, and right away everyone has to get on their hands and knees and kiss your behind. That's the sick America. That's the Trojan horse of religion. That's the abuse of the First Amendment. That's that story. Got that one out of the way. What else is in the news? 855 I don't want to read any more bad news. I'm going to take some calls. KSFO, line 8. Go ahead. You're on the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Mr. Savage, my Coast Guard son is my hero. I just wanted to tell you that. He's been in the service for almost seven years straight out of high school. I'm in Livermore. And I want to tell you that we listen to you all the time, and we thank you for your service. Uh, I'm very proud of my son. Well, that's very nice. You, so you see, you do have real heroes. To a, you know what a hero is, right? But what is? why do you think Bruce Jenner, who is a nobody, a person with sexual identity problems and an egomaniac like you can never imagine, why is he being held up as a hero when he's the opposite of a hero? Because the people in society today, the, the recent generations post-Vietnam want to be entertained. They don't care about what's going on. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to help heroes. They want to help. They don't want to help veterans. I just finished up four days at Valor Games at Coast Guard Island. I don't. I don't care if I have a dime. I just want to do what's right. I'm a born again Christian. I want to help our veterans. I'm heavily involved in veterans groups, and it all is thanks to my husband, who adopted my son at 13, and uh, helped my son realize his dream and got into the Coast Guard when he barely got out of high school. So. Well, thank you for your for your for your service to America, and let me send you a gift for your son called Countdown to Mecca. So here's another hater. Remember Jimmy Carter, what he did to this country? Well, now he's coming out saying that white Americans cling to feelings of superiority toward minorities. Can you believe that they're all in the same playbook? Hillary Clinton attacking, again, white people against minorities. Jimmy Carter, who almost destroyed America single-handedly, said white Americans cling to feelings of superiority toward minority. How would he know that? Isn't he a white American? When did Jimmy Carter become a minority? Jimmy Carter says white Americans cling to feelings of superiority towards minorities. How would the nut know that? How would this nut know this? How would this nut know that unless he feels the same thing? How would Jimmy Carter know that white people, all white people now, cling to feelings of superiority over minorities? Now, he's speaking for all white people, but how would he know what other people think? So, in other words, he feels superior to minorities. And now he's trying to project it onto the white people, onto white, the white race as a whole. How can a race survive with such haters like this in it? How do they get this way? Madness. Power madness. Bankrupt. I don't have an answer for it. KKOB Radio, Line 7. Go ahead. You're on the Savage Nation. Yes, a pleasure to talk to you. I'm a uh, doctor of medicine who's not irrational like your first caller. But I would like to corroborate what you said uh, about medicine succumbing to the fumes of the dollar. It's actually, uh, it's gotten so bad that I literally have retired. I still do some teaching and pro bono work. They've also dumbed down medical school, which you're probably aware of. And uh, they're talking about group learning and all of this sort of stuff. Well, that's to accommodate the non-English speaking of uh, a third worlders that they're flooding into the hospitals because they don't have enough kids from America to become doctors. But I've got bad news for them. Learning takes place in that 1,000 cubic centimeter thing inside your skull. Mm. And one of my heroes was my organic chemistry teacher, who was a wonderful teacher. But uh, I went to him and asked him how I could improve my uh, organic chemistry grade. And he said, well, son... Just ruin your health studying. <laughs> <laughs> Organic chemistry was the nut that cracked a lot of brains. People couldn't get through that one. They could get through a lot of courses, but organic chem was the tough one, wasn't it? 
Yeah, that was your preview to medical school. And he, in fact, said that um, this was a great guy, but he said that uh, many a young man or a woman that uh, couldn't make it in organic chemistry, I uh, recommend they go down the, 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 uh, to the business school. And he said, years later, some came back to thank me. In other words, they had made plenty of money. Yes, that's so. right. That's right. There's no, there's no guarantee that uh, uh, one thing will lead to the other, and it doesn't mean that people with money are, are bad or stupid, but certainly we know that uh, in your day, to be a doctor was a very noble thing and also a very difficult thing to achieve. Exactly, and you got that respect. Uh, but, well, you uh, deserve the respect. You're talking about, wh what year did you earn your, your medical degree in, sir? Uh, 72. I started in 68. Okay, so you're, you're going back to the age of popular culture of Dr. Ben Casey, Dr. Kildare, correct? Exactly. Ben Casey was one of my favorite shows. 1950s, Ben Casey was a doctor in a hospital, and he was a hero. And, and he was seen as a flawed hero, but still a hero. He wasn't using drugs behind the scenes as, as in Nurse Jackie today, for example. Now, when I applied for medical school, if I'd had a drug arrest, I would have been kicked out. By the time I finished, if you, they had some substance users, medical students that were substance users, and uh, the medical school would have their lawyers try to help them. So that's how things changed. Well, I knew someone who went into medicine strictly to get access to the drugs. He boasted about it. That, uh, a lot of anesthesiologists uh, do that. But really? I heard, I heard there's a high degree of um, abuse of medications by, by anesthesiologists. The other thing. So, uh, what do you think will happen to medicine as a as a field in the coming years as Obamacare kicks in? Well, regrettably, uh, in order to cope with it, physicians will become uh, unionized. You know what I mean? And uh, it, it'll be a very sorry state. Also, it'll be it'll be a race to the bottom. Less qualified people and more of them from the third world sort of H-1B visa types who can't speak the language? Exactly. and we Right. You're going to have hospitals flooded with people from third world countries who really are not good doctors, who are simply there to fill prescriptions and do whatever they have to do. That's the sad truth. You know, I want to just say this. When I was growing up, a doctor was revered. One of the top things a young man in my def day could have become was a doctor. Very difficult to get into medical school. Very even more difficult to complete medical school, never mind getting in. So doctors, rightly so, were looked up to. They made a lot of money, not by today's standards, but they did very well. And um, they were looked up to. And in the Soviet Union in the 50s, I remember reading, which shocked me, I was stunned by it, that while the doctor was looked up to in America, the doctor was considered below a teacher in the Soviet Union of the 1950s. And I couldn't understand how that worked. But as America is changing more and more to the old Soviet system and becoming more and more communized uh, over the years, I believe the same thing is happening here where the doctor is going down the scale of respect, down the scale of earning, and becoming almost a more pedestrian profession than teaching. That's where I see it going. Uh, that, that's the trajectory. I hope it's changed. But I don't know. How, how can we change it? How can we ever change this? How, how can we stop this? The young kids don't want to put in the time to become a doctor. There's still some good people there. I spent uh, a good deal of my career actually teaching, and so I actually made less money. But I don't know, what I'm saying is don't most, most young people today, don't they think they can make a fortune as a, a web designer going to work for Google? I mean, they don't want to work. They don't want to put in eight to ten years of study to make a living. My friend, Countdown to Mecca goes out to you. It's a novel that an educated man would love reading. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. What a Friday this is so far. I feel like I'm swimming through mud. I hope nothing happens. I just do. I hope it's just a quirk in my nature cup of tea a day called healthy for the heart that's an old story you know that doctor who called in the last segment he had such a calming voice that he reminded me of what was known as bedside manner in my day which is now reserved for uh, bruce jenner for example but doctors who were good healers had what was known as a bedside manner meaning their appearance when you were sick made you feel better he was a healer that doctor was a healer 
which is why he called me to say I'm not like that other doctor. You understand what? He understood the difference. So he triggered some thinking in my mind. He said the organic chemistry, how hard it was. And I reached in my library of chemistry books. Believe me, I'm no expert in the field. I've studied, I remember, a year of pharmacology and this and that. And I got totally caught up in the phytochemistry of bioactive compounds from medicinal plants for, for 20 years. But I'm no expert in the field. There are people who are far, just great experts in this field. But uh, from the average listener point of view, when you say, many of you use the word antioxidant, but you don't know what it is. You've heard it's good for you. And you say, well, wow, that's great. So we say, well, I drink uh, tea or I eat chocolate or I drink uh, red wine because I hear it's good for me. But why? Well, research says that drinking these things could cut the risk of heart attacks. What's the secret ingredient? It's a class of compounds known as flavonoids. What's a flavonoid? It's a powerful antioxidant. What's an antioxidant? Many of you use the word daily, but you don't know what it is. In simple terms, an antioxidant is a substance that, if, that offsets oxygen's damaging effects in the body. And flavonoids also make blood cells less prone to clotting. Now, why would oxygen damage the body? This is something most people can't understand. Don't we need oxygen to live? We do. So why would oxygen on a cellular level need to be antioxidized? Interesting question, isn't it? Go to graduate school and you'll get the answer. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. It is Rock and Roll Friday. We're halfway through the program today on the Savage Nation. So far, the world hasn't come to an end. I guess that's because Obama hasn't gotten up for the day yet. I don't know what he's plotting. It seems like he's always plotting something on a Friday night. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I know a lot of people watching the basketball game last night. I tried to watch it. I tried to be a good American. Some of my most intelligent friends said they're going to watch the basketball game last night. Now, I, I'm not a sports fan. I'm saying this because I know people who, who are very intelligent who are sports fans. I'm not one of them. Well, I watched them throwing the ball around for about five minutes and had to turn it off. I just can't get into it. I couldn't watch it. And that doctor's call in the last hour told me why I'm not interested in sports. I remember reading that a good percentage of our medicines today still derive from natural products, meaning come from plants or uh, minerals or whatever, from nature, in other words. that they, Although in the age of synthetic and synthetically derived medicines, about a third of our drugs still derive from nature, which I thought was amazing. Now, in Chinese medicine, this is still largely true. And people who are ignorant in this country like to think that it's all voodoo and witchcraft, and it's easy to dismiss the whole field. But what attracted me when I was very young was the whole story. It was a simple story about how aspirin was invented, discovered. And as I heard it, you know, Bayer aspirin, right? Bayer, you know the word Bayer, like the number one in the field of aspirin making. Well, I remember when I went to grad school in the first year I was in pharmacology, my professor who had been research director at Dow Chemical had moved to Hawaii to get away from the industrial Midwest. He was the greatest teacher I ever had in my life. One of the great teachers, like that doctor, sounded like him, kind, friendly, didn't try to trap you. So uh, we, we would talk about you know natural products and herbs and shoots. That's how I wound up collecting plants all those years. I was telling you about my herbarium collection, which is... 30 feet from me now. It's like an old friend has been found that was locked away in a, <laughs> an institution for years. I went and just opened up the herbarium case and saw the plant collector. I remember the day I collected them in the 60s and 70s. So I remember the story of Bayer aspirin. How did, it, how did it happen? Well, apparently in Germany, a man's father suffered arthritis. And by using the folk remedy of willow bark, they would boil salix willow bark and uh, the concoction that arose from the boiling of the willow bark the the drink the tea soothed the man's rheumatism and arthritis well the young man was very very interested in knowing what was in that stuff that enabled his father not to be crippled with you know the pain and he found that inside that that uh, stuff was a chemical structure known as salicin and he converted it into salicylic acid. It's an acetyl derivative of salicylic acid, by the way, that became aspirin. That's what it was. So in other words, it was derived originally from 
willow bark, and then he synthesized by converting the basic structure into something else, into aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid. Still one of the greatest drugs ever, ever invented. I use it all the time. I find it to be a miracle for almost everything. It's astounding. I use it as a sedative. If I take an aspirin at night, it's like a sedative for me. It's like a sleeping pill. And it doesn't harm me in any way whatsoever. I've been doing it for years. And I won't use anison and I won't use, if I have pain, I try never to use acetaminophen for the obvious reasons. I try to avoid them like the plague. There may be a better painkiller, but I don't really want to kill my liver at the same time. I just thought I'd tell you the story of the uh, of aspirin, how it came from the bark and uh, the rest is history. Then he built a whole company called Bayer, and now we have uh, that. And by the way, my, I remember, never forget as, to this day what my, chem, my pharmacology professor told me. He said, he said, when you buy aspirin, he said, always buy Bayer. I know, it's funny, they're not an advertiser, I shouldn't say, and none, none of them advertise on the show. I said, why? He said, because they still make the purest product. And he said, a lot of the knockoffs, they're not as pure. They're filled with impurities. The same is true with medicines today. You notice that when you buy a drug, and you, they always ask for what is it called when it's not the, the original drug, but it's called something else, the uh, derivative or the equivalent, where it's cheaper. I always ask for the, the original. I have to pay a lot more for the medicine because we don't know. These derivative drugs, generic, generic, generic. You think you're getting the same medicine in a generic drug. You're mistaken. You're not. They're not as good as the, uh, the uh, ph pharmacology. You know, the pharmacology is not as pure as that of the original drug in most cases. And secondly, a lot of these generic drugs are made in India, and they're, they're just filled with adulterants. You should know that. This is not an argument to say that you should pay more in general. I'm just telling you that you're getting a better product. I mean, it's like taking a Rolls Royce as opposed to a, a lesser car. Put it that way. There are differences, in other words, between a manufacturer's patented medicine and a derivative called a, uh, the equivalent, whatever they call it. I, forget what they, I keep forgetting the name for it. A generic, a generic product. Now, there are some drugs you cannot get a generic of because they, they hold a patent. They're not allowed to knock them off. I, I don't think you can get a Viagra in a, in a derivative. There are none in a, an equivalent. But uh, the day will come that you're going to get, well, you get a lot of the crap put out now. They call it Viagra, but it isn't. It made, it's a copy. They sell them all over the Internet, but they're made in, in shoddy laboratories all over the India mainly. I don't know how the Indians got into that, the shoddy drug business. I can make a general statement that would be a rim shot, but I think I'll avoid it. It'll have something to do with H-1B visas and Microsoft and uh, Facebook, but I won't go there because it wouldn't be fair. What else is in the news? Well, who knows what's in the news? What do you care? WABC Line 7, what's on your mind? Hi. Um, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm from San Diego. And uh, I wanted to talk about yesterday you brought up a point about... Um, how maybe the Israelis and the United States may be working together uh, and that ISIS uh, perhaps um, yeah. was being allowed by them to uh, prosper. Right. So, so what's your point? Right. That was my point yesterday. What's your point? Well, I, I did a little bit of research, and um, they are running a uh, pipeline, the Qatar-Turkey uh, pipeline through through Syria. I think, I think a caller mentioned that yesterday, and I brought up the fact that when Bill Clinton bombed Serbia, uh, illegally and in a war war crime, uh, committing a war crime, it was done to run a pipeline through Kosovo. Similar uh, situation, I think, uh, to what's going on in Syria. They want to run a pipeline through Syria, so they want to take out Assad. And Russia doesn't want the pipeline because it would compete with their with their oil flow. Correct? Yes, sir. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that this is uh, all very interesting because if you look at Dutch shale oil, their largest. Um, my, my father worked for a, a large oil company for a long time, and he said that the reason why they want to start pushing these pipelines is so that they no longer have to ship it through Egypt. Because, believe it or not, to get the majority of the oil, uh, the, the United States doesn't actually have a lot of oil imported from Saudi Arabia. The major oil importer uh, from Saudi Arabia is uh, Europe, and they have to go through uh, the Suez Canal, and they have to use um, some pretty big tankers. And what he was saying was, that they wanted to des to destroy American oil. Um, the Saudis want to be able to push it to the point of where it, we would be absolutely uncompetitive, and um, that's uh, another... Um, well, look, the big picture is this. Iran is hours away from sending in troops to Syria, according to reports coming out of the Middle East. 
And they're going to do it to prevent the fall of Assad because Assad's army is starting to crack right now. And uh, remember now who supports Assad. Iran supports Assad and Russia supports Assad for their own for their own uh, uh, reasons. Right. So who is it who opposes Assad? Op openly, we oppose Assad. Openly, uh, uh, covertly, Israel opposes Assad. And I believe that the Israelis and the Americans are in cahoots to bring down Assad. And it could lead to a war between our, uh, our side, meaning us and Israel, believe it or not, against Russia and Iran in a limited war over this situation. Well, that has some pretty dangerous implications. I mean, you... Well, that's what I'm sitting here in, in kind of anxiety over this, because you've got to understand that when Tehran says they're going to urgently airlift substantial numbers of Iranian troops to Syria to save Bashar Assad's regime and his army from collapse, and it could happen within hours because Syrian army divisions are dissolving under the ISIS assault, this means that the Iranian Revolutionary Guards will intervene in Syria to save Assad, and it will lead to major events in the Middle East. Yes, well, yes, sir. This may sound a bit bizarre, but the United States has been training these rebels. See, when we train them... Oh, I know that. Special forces have been in Syria for a couple of years now, uh, trying to overthrow Assad by training the so-called good Syrians. Can you tell me who the good Syrians are as opposed to the, to the terrorists amongst them? I can't. No, the situation out there is that they're both bad guys. There's just one worse than the other. So why did John McCain, the lunatic warmonger, military-industrial comp complex salesman, why has he been calling for airstrikes against Assad for several years now? What does he have in all of this? What is he trying to do? I, I couldn't tell you that, but this I, I, I believe that uh, this is one of those things that's really going to implicate Mrs. Clinton, because if you really look into it, um, the the uh, CIA annex and Benghazi, what were they doing out there? They were supplying the rebels to overthrow Gaddafi. This is the, this is the same. Yes, the, the storyline is, is that the ambassador to Libya, who was killed, was there to transfer all of the major weapon systems from Libya as it collapsed after they had Gaddafi killed, transfer them all to the, quote, rebels in Syria. I think that's what you're saying, correct? And what I'm saying is this pattern it keeps reoccurring. This is not some, you know, ragtag group of uh, rebels. I mean, they wouldn't be able to fight Assad's army. You know, I mean, going out... All right, I get it. But I, I don't think Hillary Clinton's going to be touched by that because she's busy stirring up blacks against whites right now. That's her new... Her new party line is race warfare. Well, I don't think... And that's, that's, to, get, and that's to get her ugly face away from anything to do with Benghazi. Or the the Clinton uh, library. Yes, sir. I, I find it kind of bizarre that this whole email gate is the the worst thing that we can catch them on. You know how she had all those emails and stuff like that. That's the worst thing that we can catch this woman on when she's got uh, you know so much blood on her hands of U.S. servicemen, and that includes uh, those those. Um, well, they were technically contractors but uh, look you're, you're speaking to the converted i was never a fan of the clintons i always feared them and i always saw them for what they are and i think any intelligent person doesn't want individuals like this running america let alone running the world unfortunately right now they are running the world and they're benefiting personally from it it's a, a sad situation free copy of my novel countdown to mecca goes out to you i'll be right back on the savage and Day calls at 855-407-282 Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. which tends to confirm the anxiety I've been feeling all day today about something bad about to happen. And that is this. This just came out. The Israeli Defense Department, in a very unusual announcement, on Friday night in Israel, they announced that Iron Dome rocket interceptors were deployed to defend the towns of southern Israel within range of the Gaza Strip. And they did not explain with any new information incoming from the Gaza Strip about any new plans to attack Israel. Nevertheless, they deployed Iron Dome anti-rocket batteries across South Israel. That's one part of the news. Tomorrow is Saturday, June 6th. And what is that day? 
For us in America, it marks the anniversary of D-Day, the invasion of Europe to free the Europeans from Hitler. But June 6th marks the anniversaries of two Arab-Israel wars, which began on that very day. <clears throat> the Six-Day War in 1967 began June 6th. The Second Lebanon War began on June 6th in 2006. So there's something in the air, I, I can tune, you know, like a tuning fork. And I hope that I am wrong, but I have a terrible feeling in my guts that something's about to explode in this world. And as usual, it's going to come out of the Middle East. And that may be the beginning or the end of something. I don't really know. But the breaking news is pretty interesting, is that the IDF announced minutes ago, uh, that's Friday night, of course, in Israel, that they uh, des deployed Iron Dome rocket interceptors to defend southern Israeli towns within range of the Gaza Strip. And that's the breaking news. Make of it what you wish. Make of it what you wish. I think I'm going to spend the weekend studying acetyl groups. I remember why I originally went into science was to get my mind off man. I could, at a certain point, I couldn't take, I hated politics. Then I started to hate everything about anything to do with politics, especially politicians. And I remember the piece I used to find in reading natural history, and reading science, and reading chemistry. My mind completely avoided the, the sickness of the world of man. So when I was thinking about the acetyl group being added to, salis, sal, uh, yeah, to the willow bark extract and making acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin, I said, wait a minute, the acetyl group, 3,6-diacetyl morphine is heroin. I was saying, well, what's in the acetyl group that is so phenomenally powerful that when you add it to a string of, uh, to another formula, another structure, it changes it so drastically? And it's nothing to do with politics. It's just interesting to me. Chemistry, by the way, because it was brought up, is still one of the most fascinatingly escapist topics on the planet. It's escapist in the sense that you can get rid of uh, all of the worries about mankind by looking inside a test tube, to put it that way. WMAL, line eight, are you there? Yes or no? Going once. Yes, I'm here. Uh, my, I'd like to comment on the uh, Hillary Clinton thing. Uh, you know, I, I'm actually a, a black American, and, and I'm, I'm really just sick and tired of, of a lot of the liberals playing that race card. You know, they're I don't know how she gets away. How does she go to a black college where there's almost no audience and her handlers cover up the empty seats, and the minute she speaks, she talks about blacks being disenfranchised? How could a middle-class black person not get sick over this woman? You know, and, and it's been going on for, for years now, you know, and my parents brought me up that, you know, they said, you know, nobody can keep you down. If you work hard enough, you can do anything like anybody else. Uh, no, they were 100% you know. right. Everyone has that opportunity to now. And I, and I may say so. Uh, corporations are bending over backwards to accommodate minorities. Everybody knows that. So there's never been a better time in America to make something of a person's life than today for anybody, incidentally. Oh, yeah. You know, and I own a trucking company now because of the way I was brought up, that, that I can do anything. I don't need Well, there it is. I you see, when you, when you permit yourself to be turned into a victim, you become a prisoner. That's a way of enslaving a person by letting them walk around saying, I'm a victim. We're almost flat out of time, end of hour two. I'm sending you a free copy for Father's Day of Countdown to Mecca, a novel that I'm sure you'll love reading. I have another big hour on the Savage Nation across most of America. We'll continue to talk about the news, views, and reviews right here on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. We're uh, in hour number three on Friday afternoon. The Israelis have moved Iron Dome into the south. Tomorrow uh, is Saturday the 6th, the anniversary of two wars where the friendly Arabs attacked Israel and tried to push the Jews into the sea. The Jews have learned one thing through time, which is the phrase never again. Meanwhile, here in America, we seem to have learned nothing. 
The world is changing. Your views are changing. No one knows where the lodestone is anymore. Thinking today is an endangered activity. We know we have a one-party system, and we don't know what to do about it. On that uh, stimulating note, I invite you to call uh, at 855-407-282 in the Savage Nation. I wouldn't say we're sitting here stunned that Hillary went to the uh, race warfare level yesterday because that's what she's known for. But her going so ugly so fast is quite revolting on one hand, but on the other shows a complete lack of reality. She's out of touch with reality. She gives a speech in an all-black black college. The audience is minuscule, a few hundred people. The stadium is empty, so they put up screens so the TV cameras won't show the empty audience. And she gives speeches, a speech, again going to the race and hate warfare that she's known for, saying that we're disenfranchising blacks and the poor and others, I guess people of color, from voting, which is utter nonsense. And the same day that she does this, we read that George Soros, one of the most evil men in the history of the world, is funding voters voter rights lawsuits across America. I don't understand where George Soros came from. I don't know how he got here. I don't know how a man who was a refugee from a concentration camp could hate America so much. There's things I don't understand that I don't pretend to understand. That's one of them. You know, there was a time that refugees came here and kissed the ground and then did everything they could to build up America, not break it down. This man is the opposite. He's like the evil, he's like the evil genius. He's everything Jesus warned us against. Jesus warned us against money changers in the temple. If a money trader, a currency manipulator, is not a money changer in the temple, I'd like to know what is in our time. Jesus said, beware the money changer in the temple. George Soros, in my opinion, is that money changer in the back of the temple. Billions of dollars made manipulating currencies. And yet he's held up as a hero in this country. He's the man who gave us uh, Barack Obama, along with the wonderful f souls from Hollywood. Yeah, that's right. A few people destroyed America. Just a few. It's always been only a few. And they're, they're about to do it again now by giving us the, Hild the Hilda thing. The Hilda, the Hillary, the Hillary thing. I wouldn't mind if she got up there and tried to unify America, unite America, defend America, attack ISIS, and say she'll do whatever she can to defeat them. She wants to defeat only the white person in America. By, by coming up with this big lie, it's like a blood libel. It's like blood libel from the worst of the white race is coming out of their mouths now. The lowest, lowest level of humanity is popping up out of the white race to try and grab power by attacking white people in order to steam up black people and uh, the young and minorities and illegal aliens. It's, it's a sickening situation. So, I mean, I've said my part. You could say your part. The phone number is 855-407-282. Scientists grow bio-artificial rat limb in lab. Saw that the other day. Next, lab-grown baboon arms. Maybe next, in a few years, we'll have lab-grown politicians. Maybe we could breed out racism from the politicians and hatred. And then we'd have a real candidate. Imagine if we could breed out racism and hatred in politicians in a, in a, in a Petri dish. So in the beginning of the show, we were talking about what is a hero and what is fame. They're not one and the same. That was a very important differential that I, I attempted to answer, and I didn't get to really answering it. Why was that triggered? Why was that triggered? Because you take a man as mentally un imbalanced as Bruce Jenner, a man with such an ego, a need to be looked at no matter what he does, and he, you're confusing him with a hero? And ESPN calls him a hero instead of what he is, a publicity madman. Well, it makes me think about who are the real heroes, because there are certainly forgotten heroes in this country. And what comes to mind immediately are the silent warriors that we have. They come first. The silent doctors working in obscurity who are saving people as we speak. The silent teachers who have to work under the most horrendous conditions in this country. Yeah, you name it. The silent social workers, the silenced police, they're our heroes. They're our national heroes. Certainly not someone that uh, Barry Diller would hold up as a role model. Certainly not someone with, that Katzenberg would think a movie should be made of. That's the tragedy. I also want to talk about the tragedy of sexual reassignment surgery and the, his the history of it. There's a great article on it on World Net Daily. 
the dark untold story of transgenderism. And what you don't know is that in follow-up studies, there is a disastrous track record of people who go through such surgery. Despite the lies of the media, the follow-up has shown severe depression and severe illness of one kind or another after such tr sex reassignment surgery. And you have to look at the actual evidence, by the way. Dr. Paul McHugh, a former psychiatrist in chief at Johns Hopkins, and the author of a great book called Try to Remember, Psychiatry's Clash Over Meaning, Memory, and Mind, says that the heart of the problem is confusion over the nature of, of the transgender. He said in a Wall Street Journal commentary, sex change is biologically impossible. And he cited a 2011 study at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, which followed 324 people for up to 30 years who had sex reassignment surgery. Guess what they found? Just what you'd expect. Not what CNN would tell you about the happy lives they have, but the study showed that about 10 years after the surgery, transgender people began to have increased mental difficulties. As they progressed through life, their suicide mortality rose almost 20 times above the comparable non-transgender population. McHugh points to the data as evidence that the high suicide rate trumps the typical surgery prescription propagated by many as the answer to gender confusion. Dr. McHugh points his finger at the everything is normal movement for allowing even advocating for this tragedy that is being exacted on the transgender population now cluttered with casualties of the sexual revolution. He says that the transgender suffer assumption disorder, much like other amorphic disorders such as anorexia, anorexia. He said the difference is that body parts are not amputated in an effort to cure other assumption disorders. But he said for the transgendered, this argument holds that one's feelings of gender is a conscious subjective sense that being in one's mind cannot be questioned by others. The individual often seeks not just society's tolerance of this personal truth, quote unquote, but affirmation of it. And he said he arrests the support for transgender equality. The demands for government payment for medical and surgical treatments and for access to all sex-based public roles and privileges. Dr. McHugh adds that just that is it, as it is incumbent upon the medical community to begin to speak the truth on this matter, it is equally incumbent upon the mental health community to challenge the concept that what is in the mind can never be questioned. That's absurd. He said, disorders of consciousness, after all, represent psychiatry's domain. Declaring them off limits would eliminate the entire field of psychiatry. But that is exactly what Massachusetts, California, and New Jersey have already done. Even upon, upon parental request, mental health professionals in those states are banned from trying to help children in crisis regain their natural feelings of gender. Instead, they are told to refer these children to endocrinologists to prescribe gender bending, gender delaying hormone treatments, which obviously still do not address the fatal psychological components that lead to the dramatic increases in depression and suicide. Well, I can read more from the article, and there's more data of universities that actually track those who forewent gender reassignment. And they said that 70% to 80% of those who face the confusing identity crisis but do not have the surgery report that their feelings dissipate over time. Johns Hopkins ended its sexual reassignment surgery in 1970 for the above reasons. And yet, you would think that this egomaniac, Bruce Jenner, this, this egomaniac, Bruce Jenner, is a, is a cultural hero because of the vermin in the media. Well, I couldn't let that go by. It's sickening. No one wishes harm upon people who suffer such disorders. No one says they shouldn't be allowed to act it out if they wish. But please don't tell me they're heroes because they're the opposite of what a hero is. A hero actually, if I must tell you, fights certain impulses. A hero suppresses certain urges. A hero, uh, you ask anyone in warfare, ask anyone in sports what, what that means. If a man is fighting in a, in a ring as a boxer and he's taking blow upon blow while delivering blow upon blow upon the opponent, he has trained his mind to ignore the pain of that punch or each time he was punched he would he would wince and go down so he's trained his mind not to feel the pain of that punch 
just as you have learned to not feel the pain, the pains that you're going to experience along the, the road of life. That's the norm. The norm is to know that you're going to walk on rocks. The norm is to know that you're going to have pain in your life on a daily basis, psychological pain, physical pain, emotional pain. You're going to have it, but you've got to learn how to cope with it, not to pretend it doesn't exist. And not to say to yourself, well, I have a right to act out everything that I feel. This is an extension of the hippie movement of if it feels good, do it. Or why not do it in the road? And here we are many years later. If it feels good, do it. Why not do it in the road? I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. All the news you're not going to get in the local paper. Turn off the music. I'm not interested. That's all. You want to know how low is? You want to know how low you can go? Well, Hillary has hit a new low by attacking, uh, by going to the racial level. She's gotten so ugly so fast. But here's something about as low as Hillary Clinton. You know the Westboro Baptist Church, those sick, evil men and women that say, thank God for dead soldiers. They picket soldiers' funerals saying, God, kill them because we're evil. The Westboro Baptist Church plans to disrupt Bo Biden's funeral. How low can they go? They're infamous for picketing soldiers' funerals and using hate speech, saying God hates, you know what. Well, they said they're going to protest Bo Biden's funeral tomorrow on Saturday. They will picket for at least an hour before the funeral in front of St. Anthony of Padua Church in Wilmington, Delaware. Then they attacked the poor grieving father, Joe Biden. They said, as for Bo Biden, his life was cut short by the will of God, to whom all glory is given. And he has an eternity of answering to the Lord for his own words. Thoughts, actions, and sins, the group said. I had a caller yesterday, the Jewish caller, remember, who almost accused me of the same thing? Same mentality. Same mentality. The same mentality as the, as the Westboro Baptist Church. Comes in all religions, this kind of insanity. They know who God is. I don't. They do. They know who God is because they wear a black outfit and they have breadcrumbs in their beard. They know who God is because they, they follow the commandments, so they think. Meanwhile, they, they, they ridicule everybody around them who doesn't. I thought about the egomania of religious people, super religious people. It got me so angry last night. And I realized that most of them are not religious to worship God, but it's to get over on other people and look down on everybody else. The holier-than-thou attitude of the religious, that gets me sick. I don't mind if you're religious. But if you're using religion as a weapon against people who are less religious than you or not religious at all, what does that make you? It makes you actually less of a man in God's eyes, if you want to put it in those terms. You talk about egomania. How much more egotistical does it get than someone who puts on the outfit and makes believe that they're holy because they're wearing the outfit, but uses it to put other people down? Anyway, to get back to the Westboro Baptist Church, they're going to pick at Biden's funeral. Biden joined the Delaware National Guard in 03, deployed to Iraq in 08, served two terms as Delaware's attorney general, planning to launch a campaign for governor later this year. Then this, this sick group of Westboro Baptist Church then singled out the grieving father, Joe Biden. And they said this, Joe Biden has a lifetime of rebellion to seek repentance for before his soul is re required of him, the group said. The time is short. Repent or likewise perish. That's your Westboro Baptist Church, a domestic terrorist group as far as I'm concerned. You know, I think free speech has its limits, to be very honest with you. And to me, protesting at a funeral is about as, li as far as it can go. I don't know if I would be able to control myself if I were Joe Biden. I just don't know what I would do. God forbid. Could you control yourself if a group of sick people like this in the name of God said, thank God for dead soldiers at your son's funeral? What would you do? You'd probably go blind with rage and attack them and say, you know what, I don't care what happens to me. I'm going to break their head open. I, I'll go to jail for this and teach them a lesson once and for all. You'd probably be caught strangling one of them on the ground. How much can a person take? That's what I'm asking you. How much can you take? How much can you take when you have these sick people in the name of God doing a thing like this? You know, it's one thing. You say, okay, conservatives always attack liberals. What would you call the Westboro Baptist Church? Conservative or liberal? I'd call them sick, evil men. And women, I call them sick, 
evil people. I wouldn't call them conservative or liberal. How could they do this to the Biden family? Moreover, how can they be permitted to, pr- to pick at a funeral? Why is there no law against that saying, okay, you know what? We have a First Amendment. We have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, but it's limited. You can't do it at a funeral. It's a separate category. End of story. You're not going to do it. We're not going to let you do it because that, those are fighting words and you're liable to provoke violence. So for the safety of the neighborhood, we're, we're making it illegal to do that. I want to I say to you, I would say it should be illegal to protest a funeral this, in this way. V- frankly, in any way. What do I mean in this way? In any way. Why should anyone be able to take a sacred thing like a funeral and destroy it for political reasons? Do you agree with me or disagree with me? Don't you think that there should be a limit to freedom of assembly and freedom of speech in this case? And that a funeral should be off limits, not only to the Westboro Baptist Church, or, but to any other group. Yes, I believe that, that that's a valid statement. Well, what? I have no policy position. I'm not running. I have a policy position. I have no, no power is what I was going to say. After all, I'm not Rubio with a, a string of traffic tickets. I don't know what they're digging that up for. What does that have to do with anything? That's the best they can get on him is a traffic ticket? Tell us about Hillary Clinton's money trail instead of his uh, traffic tickets. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Black Friday on the Savage Nation. I have a sense of gloom and doom. I really do. I feel like the world's going to blow. I have an intuition that something's going to happen very soon. It's going to blow it all up. I don't mean the whole world's coming to an end. Don't get me wrong. I have a feeling that when the Iranian troops, the Iranian guard, are dropped into Syria to protect Assad, and they face off against ISIS and the United States, the hidden troops we have there. This could bring Israel into the, into the mix. We could wind up with World War III. This is such a mismanaged situation. We have such a nut in the White House, such an incompetent nut in the White House. I just have this terrible feeling in my guts about the world right now because it's a little too quiet. And the country is so demented right now that we're looking at a man dressed up as a woman as though he's a hero. He is the opposite of a hero. Doesn't mean a man shouldn't dress up as a woman. He wants to do it. Why is this man held up on a pedestal as a role model? So let's go back to something uglier than ugly itself, which is Hillary Clinton's words. She is so desperate because she's collapsed in the polls because people know what a criminal she is and how unqualified she is at any speed. So she goes before, and this is a fact, by the way, an all-black college audience, no one really shows up. It's a small group of a couple of hundred people in an auditorium that could hold thousands. And her handlers drop curtains around the audience, the empty seats. So idiots don't want to know the truth about their hero. And instead of talking about an uplifting message, something uh, that a president should do to bring us together, unite us, she tries to divide us by making blacks feel that they're disenfranchised, by making the poor feel that they're disenfranchised, by making young people feel that someone owes them a living. Listen to the lie coming out of the mouth of this ugly creature called Hillary Clinton in clip three. Today, Republicans are systematically and deliberately trying to stop millions of American citizens from voting. Yes. What part of democracy are they afraid of? We're afraid of your Hitler-like behavior. I believe every citizen has the right to vote, and I believe we should do everything we can to make it easier for every citizen to vote. How many times should they vote, Hillary? As many times as they voted for your husband? Five, six times? Here's a little note. George Soros, probably the most evil man in the history of the world, next to, let's say, the overt dictators who killed millions, one of the most evil people to have ever been created by God, is going to bankroll voting rights cases. He is going to sue states that want to make certain that only qualified citizens vote and only vote once. There are other stories... I want to talk about the movement of troops from Iran into Syria to prevent the downfall of Assad. Just as I predicted yesterday, I knew that uh, that was what was behind it. I figured ISIS was being supported by the U.S. and Israel. This would definitely confirm my suspicion that the reason the U.S. has not attacked the ISIS columns, the reason the U.S. has not stopped ISIS is because they're actually our ally, as are they the ally of Israel. We're getting this from Debka file out of Israel. They say Iran is going to invoke the 06 Iranian-Syrian defense pact to urgently airlift substantial numbers of Iranian troops to Syria to save Assad's regime and his army from collapse. 
And this is because Syrian army divisions are breaking up under the ISIS assault on the northern Kurdish town of Hasaka and the onslaught of the Syrian opposition army of conquest in the southern town of Dara. Now, we have, as you well know, supplied and trained the Syrian opposition army. That's John McCain's troops. And Syrian troops are now fleeing the front lines of both battle cities. It's, as I suspected, a terrible situation that we are, we have the blood on our hands of ISIS. We Americans have enabled ISIS to get where they are to commit these atrocities against the human race. This is what happens when you have no morality in a nation. This is what happens when you have no leadership, just Machiavellian calculations. Because melting down it is. I mean, make no mistake about it. We elected these vermin called Republicans. They're worse than Democrats. Not all of them. I told you, Senator Cotton, I'd vote for him. I'd work for him. Look what they did to him. Look what they did to the real military veterans who we elected. They put them at the back of the bus. That's what the Republican establishment really is. Pure, unadulterated, greedy evil. Then you've got the rotating clown show on the Republican side. Some good men, yeah, but they're neutralizing each other. It's sad to watch, but that's what's happening. Notice that the Democrats aren't neutralizing each other. It's all a hustle, and what Obama is doing is no different than what they've done for the beginning of time in many ways, except he's a fanatic on social issues. That's the difference. But on taxation and on trade, tell me how Boehner is any different uh, than Alexander Hamilton. They're pushing a new secret White House deal with China. They won't let anyone read it. It's still hidden in the Capitol basement. And right now, Obama has a rebellion on his hands, not from the Republicans who we put in power, but who from? But from the unions and the progressives. They don't want Obama trade. They don't want this secret deal with China. But who's pushing it? John the Drunk Boehner, the gobbler, McConnell. So what's that about? It's about taxation without representation. It's about selling out the citizens to some greater power. I'm not going to ask you to call because many of you are lost already. Since I can't have you listen to me and say Republicans, good, Democrats, bad, or we're, our side is against them Dems, right away I'll get the knee-jerk uh, listeners to talk radio to call in. Yeah, Mike, them Dems are really bad, and if only we get them good Republicans in like the founding fathers, why we could save the nation. I'm a little more cynical than that. And that's why when I entered radio 21 years ago, I said, hey, don't confuse me with a Republican. I know there are many copycats right now, uh, carbon copies we used to call them, but I've been the original, the original independent in talk radio, and I have been and I continue to be. So what good does that do you? Nothing. I'm only here to entertain you. There are many other topics. The global warming lie, another shuck and jive in order to steal money from us. Climate science is a complete fraud. Complete fraud, we all know that. We've been through a cooling phase. Now they're trying to rig up the, the data now, NOAA, because there's so much money at stake. Here comes the next big lie. Again, the dictator says that under his presidency, the U.S. is the most respected nation in the world. I want you to listen to this and listen to this written by the sorority in five. You know, people don't remember. When I came into office, I remember. Uh, the United States, in world opinion, ranked below China mm -hmm. and just barely above Russia. Mm -hmm. And today... Once again, the United States is the most respected country on Earth. Where? And part of that, I think, is because of the work that we did to uh, re-engage the world and say that crazy? we want to work with you as partners uh, with mutual interest and mutual respect. Okay, you know it's a complete fabrication. He almost started World War III with Russia, which, by the way, could still happen any moment because of his insanity and his, his uh, uh, inferiority complex and his jealousy of, uh, of Putin. Now suddenly it's the most popular nation on earth. I wish that was true. But on what, what basis is it the most respected country in the world? Where would that be? In North Korea? I, where, where, where are we respected? Look, you get the picture. We can deconstruct this liar day and night. What good is it going to do? So let's move on to the other topic ideas for the savage nation. Let us see. Uh, Minnesota Muslims prefer Sharia law and would rather live in Muslim countries. But they're here. They like the green, Uncle Green. I don't understand why the Minnesota Muslims don't move to their homeland where they can be happy in Sharia law, like the Somalis. Why don't they go back to Somalia? If they want Sharia law and they don't like the white Christian culture, why don't they go back to Somalia where they had it so good? People are mutilating themselves in order to be deemed disabled. 
Hillary Clinton losing support of women. That's funny. Study shows people are consuming an average eight hours of media every day. I wonder how much I consume. I, I consume more than that. Only eight hours? That's low. I'm more like 18 hours of media. I'm rarely disconnected from a screen. People are in front of screens for eight hours a day. What else is there? What else is there? I mean, what else is there in the world other than, than screens? Why would you want to go into the re why would you want to go into the fake world of reality? We you live in the real world of unreality. I mean, what's wrong with you? Why would you want to go into the fake world of reality? The uncomfortable, impossible fake world of reality when unreality awaits us at every turn. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. The only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. It has been quite a week on the Savage Nation. I would say the high or low point, depending upon your religious viewpoint, was when I asked on Wednesday, should all the passages calling for murder and killing be taken out of the Old Testament and the Quran in the United States? That set off a, a shockwave. And in typical fashion, no one else mentioned it in the media, even though it's the most, I would say, the most poignant question in the history of talk radio and the most daring question ever raised in talk radio. I wouldn't expect anyone to mention it. It's easy to talk about other subjects. That's a tough one. And then uh, I would say yesterday's show was another, you know, kind of <laughs> seminal show, a, a tour de force. I don't even want to repeat it. It was awesome. The music that I picked. And my sense that it's all um, uh, a hustle, everything's a hustle on both sides of the aisle, was a good show. I know it's negative. I know you want to believe in something, and you got to believe in something, and you got to let those balloons fly and clap and cheer when the politicians speak. But I don't know. I'm pretty cynical. I was cynical at age five by what I saw in the world. So what should I do, sit here and cheer you on and tell you this one, that one? I don't know. You'll make up your own mind anyway. Just remember, I'm only a talk show host. I am not a politician. It is not my job to promote any candidate. I'm not in business to promote candidates. In fact, I think it's illegal to promote candidates. To be very honest with you, I don't know how people in talk radio who have candidates on on one side of the aisle and not others get away with it because I think it's purely illegal. If I were to only have Republican candidates on this show and no Democrats, I would be violating the laws of the public airwaves. Now you'd say, well, it's just balancing out what they do on the other side. That's true. They are violating the laws as well. Talk radio is more than politics. How many times have I had to say to you over the 20 years that if this was just about politics, I would have left after the first day? There's so much more in the world than politics. And yet politics seems to rule the day in talk radio. Somebody called talk radio today, conveyor belt radio. Conveyor belt radio. Rush comes on, and the next one comes on, the next one comes on, the next one comes on. And whatever he does, they copy. Like a conveyor belt. The same topics. They, he said, with the exception of you and maybe Alex Jones, there's nobody else doing original radio. I said, okay, whatever you want to think, but I didn't come into this business just to talk about politics. My mind is, is, you know, not made that way. So I tried to do that this week. Was I quoted anywhere? No. Did anyone say it's one of the most brilliant radio shows they ever heard? No. Was I invited to a corporate a retreat to talk about my ideas? No. Was I offered a prize from the radio industry for breaking new ground? No. No one heard it, except you, the audience. So I keep doing it anyway, because I make, see, I make believe I'm in a cafe called Cafe Savage, and I own the cafe. And you come into the cafe to relax, to have a cup of coffee, a biscotti, whatever, glass of wine, whatever you want. And in the typical fashion of a cafe owner of the old days, basically I talk, and we have a conversation. That's what a cafe is. I mean, that's what it used to be until they became Starbucks. That's not a cafe. So there's a coffee house. It's different. They serve coffee. That's not a cafe. So let's talk about all the other topics. Now, I have some political topics up on michaelsavage.com, home of the Savage Nation. Let's look at them. Obama secretly backing the Muslim Brotherhood. A strategy document regards the group as moderate. You hear this? And They're moderate, the Muslim Brotherhood, and their front group in America is CAIR. Next one. Huge drop in stop and frisk as New York City crime increases. Raises fear that cops are reluctant to confront criminals. No kidding. What would you do if you were a cop? You'd stop and frisk a thug? And if, God forbid, he didn't have a gun, you'd go to jail and lose your job? So let him go kill somebody. That's all. 
Not till all of America becomes Baltimore and everyone's begging for a cop again, then maybe we'll have a, a law and order again in this country. No, let the liberals destroy everything. Then maybe the America will wake up to what liberalism does. Here's another fake imam. Listen to this story. Gangster turned imam may have radicalized dozens behind bars. See, this is the new racket. He was a gangster in Brooklyn, held up banks, just a plain out gangster. Former U.S. Marine, became a Muslim radical, gang leader and bodyguard to the blind sheik behind the 93 World Trace and a bombing. This dirty lawyer wants him freed immediately. See, that's the new game, is that if you're if a criminal, a career criminal, now calls himself an imam, suddenly everyone gets on their hands and knees. Oh, he's a religious figure. Oh, we can't say anything to him. Oh, no, everyone's an imam. Savage.